The picture of their court as dull and stupid and unintellectual is simply not true. Mm. Certainly not in these early years where they're both healthy and active. That was Janice Hadlow talking about the private lives of George III and his wife Charlotte. Leonardo da Vinci, one of the greatest masters of art and, and Renaissance science of all time, he did over 200 drawings of anatomised bodies, and his influence was effectively zero. And that was Adam Rutherford discussing art and anatomy. You're listening to the History Extra podcast from BBC History magazine. We're the UK's best-selling history magazine, available from all good newsagents or via subscription. Check out our latest subscription deals at historyextra.com forward slash subscribe. The magazine is also now available on many digital devices, including the iPad, iPhone, Kindle, Kindle Fire, Google Play, Kobo and Zinio. Look out for us in your app store or newsstand, or find out more at historyextra.com forward slash digital. Hello and welcome to the latest episode of the History Extra podcast. I'm Rob Attar, the editor of BBC History magazine. Now George III was one of the longest reigning monarchs in British history, and his final years were marked by recurrent physical and mental illness. But what was his private life really like? That's the subject of Janice Hadlow's new book, The Strangest Family, which explores the domestic lives of the King, his wife Charlotte, and the rest of the Hanoverians. Our book's editor, Matt Elton, met up with Janice to find out more, and he began by asking her about the things that shaped George III as a young man. So as a very young man, um, after his father dies, I think, I think we're talking about George III as Prince of Wales now, I think, uh, I mean, again, anyone who knows even a little bit about George III knows uh, unsatisfactory education, regarded as being um, very difficult to educate, being somebody who's very behind, and his own mother says, I'm very worried about his progress, um, despite having lots and lots of different tutors. Uh, I think there's a moment when what that really, when, when you read about, when you're reading these, these, these accounts, when you realise that actually this isn't a kind of willful laziness, which for a lot of contemporaries thought. I think myself, it's, it's terror, actually. I think it's a complete horror at the sense of this destiny of kingship that is approaching him and his own very, very deep sense that he may not be up to the job and how on earth is he going to do this? And I think he retreats into a slightly sort of almost catatonic stage of, of just not being able to cope with this as a very young man. And he, he is rescued from this state by this very charismatic uh, uh, mentor, uh, John, uh, the Earl of Butte, who uh, had been a friend of his father. Frederick had known him very well. And that what Butte does is he, first of all, I think he quite likes George, the young man, and I don't think a lot of people had. I think mm. he comes into his world as a, he's obviously a hugely charismatic man. There's a brilliant portrait of him. He was set up at Best Legs in London. He's got these sort of <laughs> smouldering, dark-eyed looks. You know, he's a very handsome man. But also um, an intellectual, uh, somebody deeply interested in big ideas, and I think, I think he provides, he, when he arrives into uh, George's life, he provides him with a vision of how the future can be that nobody has ever given to this rather tentative, diffident young man before. And part of that is tied up with the idea of how family life relates to kinship. And I think what he tells George, to put it very briefly, is that um, in the modern world, i.e. when kings are no longer called upon to be leaders in battle, or to, you know, what is the role of kingship? Mm. And Butte and George together figure out that actually the big role for kingship is about moral leadership, actually. Moral leadership in politics, you know, the king's job is to is to be somehow above and beyond the, the, the in and out world of party, to be to say something different about the, uh, the role, of, the importance of, of something in the state that isn't just about individual policies, it's about something bigger and larger than that. Mm. But I think he also tells George that actually 
um, goodness is important. You know, your, mo- your moral values are as important here as your cleverness or your bravery. And I think that while George often had doubts about, well, certainly when he was a young man, less so than he grew or older, but had a lot of doubts about whether he was clever enough or strong enough to be king, I think he always thought he might be good enough to be king. That's interesting, yeah. So that yeah. element is very important, I think, and, and that... that the, the, the importance of Butte and George in these young days, when you know, uh, George is a teenager, very, very susceptible to this, as I say, this very attractive, charismatic figure who gives him a kind of vision of how he might navigate into this new role. He knows he can't... I, mean, I, th- I think you have to sort of think, it in, think into, his, into his mind. What must it have been like to know that this thing was coming? That, yeah. what, you know, that you were going to be king at some point... Uh, and how on earth were you going to deal with it? You know, and if you are a sort of rather shy, naturally shy, naturally diffident personality with a lot of self-doubt. Mm. I mean, the letters that George writes to Butte at this time are extraordinarily. He has a very, very low opinion of himself. You know, very, very uh, self-lacerating, very, very uncertain about himself. And Butte, frankly, gives him a bit of reason to go on. So I think there's an intellectual moment with Butte when a lot of the things that he, he realises, I think, has, I think George always has a reasonable understanding of his own personality. I think he knows the kind of person he is. And this provides him, I think, with a new vision of what kingship can be, that it's about moral leadership. And one of the ways that you show that you're worthy of occupying this role is by the way you live yourself. Mm. Not just what you do as a king, but also what you do as a father, a brother, a husband. That the whole set of things is connected. That you need to do totally all connected. Yeah. And that you can't... It's very difficult for you to be a good king without being a good man. We'll head back to talking about George in a minute, obviously, yeah. but I do want to talk a lot about Queen Charlotte. Yeah. Because she's a fascinating figure. Yeah. Um, what do you make of their relationship uh, from its beginnings onwards, I suppose? Perhaps the most amazing thing about their relationship is that they only meet on the day that they're getting married. So that uh, Charlotte arrives from Germany uh, one afternoon and they get married that evening. And so she's never seen, you know, they've never seen each other at all before the day when they actually marry each other. However, uh, George took a lot of trouble beforehand to try and find what he thought would be the right woman to help him in this project, really. There's a lot of worry about some of the people uh, who are discussing whether she's the right candidate for Queen or not, about whether she's been properly prepared for it. You know, it's a quite a, it's a provincial life she's used to. Will she be up to doing it? And George is always very confident and says, that would be fine. <laughs> <laughs> yes. And I think, I think he picks well in the sense that they are, and for, you know, for a very long time, their marriage works very well, I think, because they, or at least superficially, because they are very similar in character. You know, Charlotte too is uh, dutiful, obedient, somebody with a very, very high sense of personal duty, uh, somebody who um, is happy in a way to be uh, to be guided and led by a more powerful man, by a husband, um, someone who understands the nature of her role. You know, she gets, I think, quite quickly what she's going to be required to do. And equally loves a quiet life. You know, she's not somebody who's, she's not, she's not a, she's not someone who's looking for a particularly uh, glitzy, uh, glamorous court life. Right. She's somebody who, who appreciates George's desire to live a, a quiet domestic life, to try and have a retreat from the hurly-burly of society, to want to try and have something that uh, feels as though it's theirs and not owned by the rest of the world. Yeah. And I think in their early days, everybody comments in the first few years after their marriage how well it seems to be going. I mean, even somebody like Horace Walpole, who's you know, oh, quite, not the most generous of commentators, you know, <laughs> says at the very beginning, it doesn't look as though these two people are going to be the most unhappy in the world. And I think for, you know, for a very long time, um, they manage it very well. Charlotte is, is helped immensely by her fertility. You know, she becomes pregnant very quickly. Uh, and does the thing that even in the 18th century a queen was most required to do, which is to provide um, to provide an heir. She doesn't just produce one; she produces an immense a, a positive, uh, uh, you know, richness of heirs, really, uh, which later goes on to cause its own issues in many ways. But you know, she does. She's healthy. Yeah. She has babies quite easily. Um, 
And she, you know, she enjoys a lot of literally a lot of the other things that George likes. They're both passionately fond of music. They both admire. They both actually have a very good connoisseur's art eye. You know, interested in, in contemporary art. Interested. Both of them are readers. Charlotte even more than George. Yeah. Um, I mean, for me, I think the interesting thing about Charlotte is uh, how clever she is, and uh, what a what a voracious intellect mm. uh, she. She has underneath this very, initially at least, quite a kind of um, compliant. That's what's so interesting for me is that she manages to do both of these things. She yeah. manages to keep them both in her personality at the same time. Which is I think she realises quite early on that you know it, that, that she has to find a way. And I think there's, she, there's, in the 1770s and 80s, that's when she's really sort of trying to work that out for herself. Is you know how can I express these things which give me immense private satisfaction, but not uh, but not somehow become the object of um, uh, ridicule for being a blue stocking woman. You know, yeah. how, do I, how do I manage those worlds? And, and interestingly, you know, she, there, are, there are some quite good role models that are very important to her. You know, she's a great, she, the, both the King and Queen are very interested in the, in the world created by the Duchess of Portland at her house in Bullstrode, where you know, they go there and they see this is a model really, you know, this is rational, domestic, affectionate family, but also part of that world is a, um, a questioning and interest in the wider intellectual things of life. You know, this is a world interested in geology, in archaeology, in philosophy, in talking about subjects. And they looked on that as a sort of model of perhaps how their own life might be. That, you know, can, how do you infuse into your private life the life of the mind a bit? Mm. Certainly for Charlotte, I think that's immensely important. You know, yeah. what, what, do, what do queens do all day? <laughs> and, and she, you know, she says at one point, she's, she's all, she says repeatedly to her daughters, you know, I, 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 I'm very impatient with people who are asking, always asking, what should we do now? And then she says, occupy yourselves. This is her great kind of cry. And for her, that meant mostly occupy yourself with the life of the mind. I mean, she's a great sewer. You know, she does have that traditional side to herself, which is, you know, she's interested in the traditional female pursuit. She's a great embroiderer, a great sewer. You know, she doesn't, she's not somebody who will turn her back on this as a great gesture. But what she tries to do, as you say, is find a way of integrating that traditional vision of the feminine world with this other, actually, slightly more steely pursuit of big things and big ideas. She never stops reading. I mean, never, ever stops reading. If you read the journals of Fanny Burney, who is... Um, her assistant dresser and who leaves a journal of her court life which is perhaps the closest picture of Charlotte at that time you know, here's a woman who never goes into anyone's room the first, except without going up to their bookshelf and look at what books they're reading you know, who constantly is saying to Fanny Burney, have you read this? have you read this? what do you think of this? have you read that? and who at one point describes to Fanny how she has a man who goes to the barrows in London on which second hand books were sold to buy books for her to keep her book it's habit going. Huge appetite. Yeah, yeah. Absolutely huge appetite. And you know, that is something with which George sympathises. You know, again, the picture of the picture of their court as dull and stupid and unintellectual is simply not true. Mm -hmm. Certainly not in these early years where yeah. they're both healthy and active. Yes. But it, but there's no doubt that there is another side to Charlotte which her own letters to her brother reveal. And that is she's very lonely. Now, right from the beginning when she arrives at court, George makes it very clear to her that she is not to associate with, she's not to make close friends, she's to keep herself separate from a lot of the people at court. He's worried about people flattering her, he's worried about alliances being made that may be difficult, he's worried about managing the political side of her private life, all of which, as Charlotte herself says, she understands is legitimate. But it does leave her, she's only 17 when she marries him, you know, it does leave her as a very isolated figure. And in those young years, I think she's often a very lonely, isolated figure. She talks a lot about, uh, again, in later years when she's had many, many children, she does at one point write to her husband, uh, write to her brother saying, you know, I think her attitude to childbearing is not, you know, so, oh, the face she always presented to the world was that, you know, she saw this as part of her duty, she's extremely proud of her large and healthy family, but there is a moment when she's had, I can't remember how many children she's had at that point, and she says, I wish my long campaign was over, you know, when yeah. she just wants it to be a, an end, and, you know, it's a, she really spends the better part of 20 years having babies, and I think 
every so often in these letters she writes to her brother you get a much bleaker picture of her role mm. you know she's she finds the life very constraining she's not free to do the things that she wants to do she's perpetually pregnant she's isolated she's not allowed to form friendships she finds the, the requirements of having to uh, appear in public to go to military reviews which she hates to appear on the terrace to show herself to people to be at court she finds this very 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 innovating and exhausting and wonders in these letters to her brother whether this is the kind of whether she can sustain this life mm. In the end, of course, she does because that's the kind of person she is. You know, she's a very, very dutiful person for whom obligation is always at the heart of everything she does. But I think that's genuinely quite a new thing to understand about her is that you know she has this she has she has a much darker perception in her own mind for many years of her own role. It's interesting. Yeah, talking some more about those pressures. Um, how did George's moral ideals? exert pressure on the practical running of, of, of the family and of the house? Well, it goes brilliantly when the children are small. I mean, I think when you, you know, when you read, when you read the stories about uh, how, how, the, how their life, it, for a long time, when the children are very small, it really does seem, except when you read Charlotte's private letters, I was just saying, where you do get a sense of, of the toughness of it. I mean, in many ways, it works, seems to work very well. You know, there's no doubt that uh, George loved small babies, uh, so much more affectionate than certainly than his grandfather, you know, who who says at one point, you know, I admit when children were young I hated them running in and out of my room, you know. Uh, but George III, there are many, many accounts of him playing on the floor with the children, uh, losing the dignity of a king, and playing on a carpet with Amelia, his daughter, or carrying his little naked baby son around. You know, he's a very loving father. and. Lots of accounts of the ways in which you know, he will make sure, even before the day's business begins, he'll knock on the door to make sure that the children are all healthy. He takes a personal interest in what they're eating. Um, all the children are inoculated, interesting, you know, right from the beginning. They realise that's a big deal. Uh, very interested in the kind of education, although probably that's more Charlotte than George, certainly. So when they're young, it's, it's a very positive picture, I think. Um, it gets far more complicated as they grow older, and uh, the idea that actually, especially you know, both boys and girls, that they might have desires or wishes which conflict with the vision that George has for the future, that's where, that's where the tensions begin to show themselves, and that's where things begin to get difficult. Mm -hmm. um, and where, but, but I think in those early days, uh, certainly it's, it's, it's fair to say that you know, I, there is a very positive side to this new life, which is that the domestic vision looks like a very looks a great improvement on what had gone before. Yes. I mean, behind that, when you read when you read the accounts of, uh, especially again, it's mostly the women. The boredom of life is quite apparent. You know, uh, there's no doubt Charlotte was bored a lot of the time. She tries to bring into the household uh, clever women with whom she can form relationships of the mind. Uh, firstly, a very uh, lively, thoughtful, clever woman called Mary Hamilton, who comes in as part of the, the life with Charlotte and the children. Later on, of course, Fanny Burney does the same. Charlotte does this, I think, partly for her own intellectual stimulation, but also, she's quite clear about this in some of her letters, that she wants her daughters to see what a, how important it is in the court world, which is often, has all those requirements about it which can be quite dull to have an intellectual life for yourself yeah. so and there, you know she, there is a moment I think when that works quite well although it's interesting that none of those women stay everybody in the end finds the pressures of life in the spotlight uh, the requirements of the formal behavior uh, that you're the, the endless the endless uh, um, etiquette and ceremonial life that you have to live is just too dull for them and they all in the end leave. Well, Charlotte can't be. No. <laughs> so, you know, that's the paradox of their lives, really. Yeah. But I think, you know, that so even when the children are small, there is still that sense of, especially for Charlotte, about how am I managing this life? But I think that, you know, the, there are many, many positives in that early phase, uh, yeah. most of which are about, you know, the, the devotion that the, that the king and queen show to their children, you know, the fascination they have with trying to bring them up as far as possible in... Um, 
circumstances which will allow them as much freedom as possible. You know, this is a this is a time in which ideas of childhood are changing very rapidly. Yes. Uh, both of them, very interestingly, uh, all you know, both of them have read, Rousseau, have read Rousseau. I mean, it's impossible to overstate how important Rousseau is at this moment in changing ideas about what it is to be a child and how you treat children and what kind of what kind of um, upbringing they should have. And a lot of the ideas that Rousseau writes about, George and Charlotte do actually try to introduce into the upbringing of their own children. You know, everyone knows, I think, that they, their children are required to till a little bit of ground. You know, they have their own little bit of agricultural pursuit to do. Yes. Uh, very, you know, their, 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 their food is very plain. I mean, plentiful, but plain. Um, they're dressed very simply. You know, they're very much dressed in what is almost the uniform of the modern child. You know, open neck shirts, loose clothes. But right from the beginning, I suppose for the children as well as for George and Charlotte, there is a contradiction between that free life and the life that they have to live as princes and princesses. So you see it very much in the life of the elder princess. So at the same time that the young George IV, Prince of Wales, is being brought up to be a Rousseau-esque child tilling the ground, but at the same time as that, you know, George and his, young, and his brother Frederick, Duke of York, you know, they are required to be formal princes as well. And right from the very beginning of their life, they're on show. And there is this contradiction between them as free, natural children and then as, you know, when he's six or seven, uh, George is being required to, the young George is being required to um, take, uh, to, to, to take audiences with people who come to pay their respects and to be that formal public being. And I think that is the fault line in this world, uh, the, the fault line between your private, intimate life and your public, displayed life, that is the one that you know, the whole family, in the end, uh, finds it most difficult to deal with. Um, one external question we should talk about mm. is the pressure of uh, politics, yeah. particularly during the first half of George's reign. Um, how much of a pressure was this? Well, I think it takes... Um, one of, the, one of the great moments in George's early life is, is when Bute, his great mentor, who becomes, as George and he have always planned that when George succeeds to the throne that, that Bute will be the first minister and that together they're going to change the landscape of politics and you know, everything is going to be um, uh, autumn change. Um, Bute tries and can't bear it. I mean, finds the actual practice of 18th century politics just too overwhelming, too grubby, too awful. I mean, he has a very tough time of it. He's unpopular because he tries to bring, they, George and he tries to bring an end to the, the, to the, to the war. It's an unpopular peace. Uh, managing it, managing, uh, imposing this peace on a restive House of Commons was an appalling experience for Butte. And in the end, he just decides he can't stand it. And he leaves. Mm. And that's a terrible moment for George. Uh, again, I think the realisation that even politicians can leave, yes. but if you're George or Charlotte, you never can. You know, yeah. This is for life, for life for you. You have no get-out-of-jail card at all. And I think after Butte goes, it takes an awful long time for George to be able to find any, any politician with whom he really feels that he can do business or with whom he feels um, an affinity. He's a... He's, I think, in, in, as a young man, he finds his, his involvement with, with senior ministers quite difficult. As I say, he's quite a shy, diffident person underneath his public persona. Um, and he has a lot to deal with. You know, th these are very turbulent years, 1760s. And certainly going into, you know, the, the, uh, the early years of the American War of Independence. This is a huge, a huge thing for him to deal with. So the, the pressures of his political world, I think, actually make make the importance of a stable, happy family life to which he can retreat even more important. Um, we should talk about his illness. Yeah. Um, at what point did it first manifest itself? Well, there's some discussion about whether he was actually ill for the first time in the 1760s, but you know that's, that's a subject of great debate. But the, 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 the first really serious illness happens in 1788 um, and you know, lasts, throughout, lasts through to... Uh, 1789. This is the great. This is the first great attack of madness that, that, that happens to him. Um, he's been very healthy up until then. You know, for an 18th century man, he's actually lived, lived been remarkably free of illness. Yeah. Part of that was because he, he was obsessed by his weight all his life. Um, 
eats very, very little. You know, one of the things that's always noticed about, and it's, it's, it's used as an explanation for why he's fallen ill, is about how little he eats. You know, he's, he talks about, when people ask him, why do you eat so little? He says, it's just that I prefer to be, eat sparingly to growing fat and ill. Um, so he, he's, and, and that probably, he doesn't drink very much. You know, he's not a great drinker, unlike his, unlike his sons. Keeps him in quite good health for a long time. And this comes out of nowhere, really, which is why I think it's so shocking to everybody. Yes. Um, it's really horrifying to read. I mean, there, you know, there, there are two or three great, great accounts of it kept by people who were there at the time and, and watched what happened to him. Um, and it starts off by, I think, I think it's, it's the complete, nobody know, nobody understands, nobody knows what this is. And the speed with which he becomes very, very sick is a shock to everyone. Yeah. And I think one from which actually neither he nor the family ever quite recover. It sounds terrifying. Just from, yeah, you're Absolutely just terrifying. Yeah. I mean, you know, the, the, for somebody who's always been so, I mean, firstly, the physical side of it, you know, he's in great pain a lot of the time. He, he, uh, he's, he, no, for reasons nobody can understand, uh, he then the, the, the way that the, the illness affects his behaviour. You know that he goes from being a man who's always been very controlled, who's always had a very, a very uh, apparently, I think self-control was always very important to George. The sense that he's somebody for whom he, the mastery of his emotions. You know, he's someone who has always put his duty over his feelings. Uh, somebody who's worked very hard to suppress emotional feelings that don't match what he sees is required of him in his public role. And to lose control of that, I think, was a very... And as well, he knows it's happening to him. I mean, I think that's the great tragedy in the, in the early phases of all his illnesses, is he, he, he has this sense that this thing is happening to him and that he's out of control. And I think that's terrifying for him. Very terrifying for his family, though, you know, to be faced with this um, very large and powerful man physically as well. You know, very early in his illness, as in the first illness, he throws the Prince of Wales against the wall in, uh, in, after in, at this terrible dinner party where everything goes terribly wrong. And I think, you know, that he's, a, he's you know, he's, he's that sense of his physicality. I think is very important in this. Yeah, some of the interesting thing from the book is uh, the new theories that science has been able to, you know. Uh, show us about the illness. Are there any new findings that are particularly well, interesting? I think that, I mean, the latest thinking, the, for a long time everybody thought it was porphyria. Mm. Uh, there's some new, some new work has cast, has, has, has effectively asked some questions about that, about whether that's the correct diagnosis, and has suggested that it may be that um, these were actually, uh, psych these were episodes of psychiatric disturbance, you know, that these were I have manic episodes that they were linked to the kind of enormous pressure on his life. Um, I, I'm honestly not sure what I, I feel that. I mean, what I've tried to do in the book is to set out both of those, uh, both of those views, and because um, I think it's very hard at this distance to be able to say. Um, but it's interesting that you know the, certainly what has been the, the porphyria diagnosis, which has been accepted for many years, has quite recently there have been questions asked about whether that's correct or not. Yeah. Um, whatever it was, uh, I think everybody certainly is forever after always terrified that it will come back. You know that yeah. sense that actually this is something which may return, and the absolute horror of the family as well as the political world when. Indeed, it does. Mm. You know, um, you really feel for them. I think is is the thing from this account. I think you just because they're so humanised, you just think it's. I think it's. I think it's the. I think. I think it's the combination of again many of the things which are so potent in what we were talking about. The gap between the the, the tension that, that sits between the public and private lives is very apparent during his illness. Yeah. You know that this would have been bad enough for anyone in the 18th century world to have to deal with, you know, the lack of, the, the terror and horror of mental illness of any kind, uh, the complete, I mean, the, the puzzle of the doctors, the fact that nobody, none of them, uh, these aren't stupid men either, you know, they're limited by uh, what 18th century medicine knew and could tell, yeah. but, you know, their, their, their sense of the out of controlness of, of, of both the physical and mental symptoms, and just literally the horror of those people who are close to him. And the terror, though, of this somehow being public knowledge, and yeah. the fact that you know this is something that, because this is so regarded as being shameful and something to be concealed, 
the inability to do that and the knowledge that actually this was all being uh, dissected, debated, thought about in the public world, I think added an extra dimension of, of horror for the family at the time. That was Janice Hadlow. The Strangest Family, The Private Lives of George III, Queen Charlotte and the Hanoverians, is out now, published by William Collins. You can read more from Matt's interview with Janice in the September issue of BBC History magazine, which is out now. Also this month, Tracy Borman and Hilary Mantel discuss Thomas Cromwell's relationship with Henry VIII. Plus, we explore Britain's plans to repel a Nazi invasion, a crisis in ancient Rome, and how the James Bond novels relate to Jamaican history. You can get hold of our September issue in all good news agents or as a digital edition. Janice will also be talking at this year's BBC History magazine History Weekend, which is taking place in October in Malmesbury. Tickets are still available for some talks, and for more details and to book, please visit historyweekend.com. And now we have a short advertisement break. It's a long way to It's 100 years since the outbreak of the First World War. And at the Woodland Trust, we're offering a really personal way to remember those involved. Dedicating a tree in one of four centenary woods we're creating across the UK. These ever-growing tributes to the past will stand for generations to come. To dedicate your tree, visit woodlandtrust.org.uk or call us on 0800 915 1914. The Woodland Trust is a UK registered charity. It's now time for the latest news with our website editor, Emma McFarnan. Many of Britain's historic houses are undercharging visitors and should raise their prices, a new survey suggests. According to a study carried out by the Historic Houses Association, some venues are charging as little as a £3 entry fee and are afraid to set higher prices. Robert Parker, the association's technical advisor, told The Telegraph that houses charging under £7 should increase prices and that those at the lowest end of the scale should charge at least £5. What do you think of the suggestions? Take part in the debate by tweeting us at History Extra or by posting on our Facebook page. In other news, it has been revealed that people in the medieval period enjoyed pasties and sweet and sour dishes, just as we do today. According to George Dobbs, a freelance writer who specialises in history and literature, many of our modern favourites, such as pasta and rice pudding, may have roots in medieval kitchens. A recipe for sweet and sour rabbit can be found in Maggie Black's The Medieval Cookbook, which dates to the 14th century, alongside instructions of how to make candy. To read more about this, visit historyextra.com. Meanwhile, the US Secretary of Defence has recommended a posthumous medal of honour for a black First World War soldier from New York, who saved a comrade while fighting off a German attack in France. According to The Guardian, Chuck Hagel has sent Congress a letter saying that Sergeant Henry Johnson should receive the nation's highest military decoration for bravery in combat. The railroad porter from Albany was serving in the all-black 369th Infantry Regiment when he killed or wounded several enemy soldiers while saving a fellow soldier from capture. The MEDA request requires passage of special legislation in Congress because Johnson's actions were more than five years ago and the President gets the final word on the decision. Thanks, Emma. Our second interview this week is with Adam Rutherford, a science writer and broadcaster. Adam is currently presenting a new series on BBC4 entitled The Beauty of Anatomy, which looks at over 2,000 years of anatomical study and explores connections between anatomy and the creation of great art. I caught up with Adam earlier this month to find out more. For those listeners who may not be too au fait with the subject, could you just please explain what exactly anatomy is and how it differs from something like biology? Anatomy is the study of the body, right? And, and human anatomy is a study of human bodies, but anatomy applies to all biology in that the, the scientists over the years have taken apart bodies of animals and humans in order to understand how they work. 
I was at medical school just for a year before I transferred to um, genetics, but we did, I did the anatomy course as a, as a first year medic. And the anatomy professor used to refer to it as plumbing and carpentry. So it's, uh, in, in very crude terms, it's how the bones fit together, how the organs fit together. But in modern terms, it's a scientific discipline in itself and is in, incredibly intricate and delicate because we, we have come to realize over the last three or four hundred years that our bodies are holistic things and anatomy cannot be separated from physiology or from pathology or from neurology or genetics or any of the aspects of biology that make us alive. Who would you say were the first anatomists in history? Well, in the series, and I don't think this is an unreasonable supposition, we, we put the first anatomist or the first really serious anatomist as being this chap called Galen, uh, or Claudius Galenus is, is how he's sometimes referred to. And he was a first century Greek physician writer who went into the Roman Empire. And he really was the first person to put anatomy as a discipline in itself. The other classical scholars had serious attempts at anatomy in the previous centuries, you know, even going back to Aristotle and, and before. But Galen was really the guy who put it on the map as a, a specific subject in its own right and wrote extensively on how the human body works, although much of his writings are based on dissections of monkeys, macaques and pigs as well, as, as it wasn't always uh, e easy to get hold of humans. And am I right to say that Galen's influence on anatomy wasn't just from his own time but then continued for hundreds if not thousands of years? Undoubtedly, undoubtedly. His, his influence was extraordinarily profound and w we clock it up to the 15th century with Leonardo in, in the first episode but then after him, possibly the next greatest anatomist was a, a Belgian chap called Vesalius and he very clearly is um, is getting many of his cues from the classics, and you know, bearing in mind that this is a lot of this is happening in the in the Renaissance, and so people are looking to the classical world for uh, for intellectual guidance. And when it comes to anatomy, in, intellectual guidance came almost exclusively from Galen. Why do you think it, it took so long for people to surpass someone who'd been working, say, two thousand and more years ago? Well, he wasn't wrong. There were a few things that he didn't get quite right. And in terms of the actual visuals, he never drew anything. He believed that uh, pe people should not draw their anatomized bodies because that would stop them from understanding them because they'd have sort of, you know, cheat sheets in an effect. But he was, he, he really introduced the concept which has remained true in anatomy for the, for, until now, continues in, to this day, which was that you can only really understand how bodies work by getting your hands dirty, right? By getting stuck in and taking uh, organisms apart yourself. And you know, he got a lot of his knowledge from working with gladiators, with wound, you know, wounded gladiators. And so he was very hands-on and very willing to get stuck in and, and do the dissections himself. And that passed on through Vesalius and through Leonardo and, and the anatomists of the 18th and 19th centuries, and in fact, the word autopsy it reflects that. The meaning of the word autopsy means literally to see for yourself, and that, that really does carry on in medical schools to this day, where the only way you can really understand how bodies are put together on the inside is by taking them apart yourself. And what do you think the early anatomists saw themselves as doing? Because science didn't really exist in, in the way it's understood now, then what, what did they see their discipline as? It's an interesting question and we were quite keen as sort of lay art historians really you know really I was approaching this from a scientific point of view but quite keen not to fall into the trap of presupposing or second guessing what these uh, characters were thinking. Certainly though it's not unreasonable to suggest that people like Galen and Vesalius were celebrating the divine they're celebrating God's great creation in analysing our bodies. Later on, you know, by the 19th century, that begins to fall away as the, our modern concept of science emerges. And then, you know, the whole point of the programme really is to look at, look at how the interaction between these guys who initially with Galen were 
trying to understand how the human body works, but how it then mutates into this sort of during the Renaissance this discipline which is determined not just by scientific advances but by artistic ones as well because the beauty of the body and the beauty of analyzing the body as well as celebrating some of the colossal egos of the people of the protagonists was was where you get this huge blossoming from the renaissance onwards of art which is of bodies and you know filled studded with these memento mori so you know images of death skulls skeletons and, and those sorts of things. So it's a, it's really a, you know, a huge melee of initially science, a lot of theology, a lot of politics, and then, and then this really intense artistic interest that emerges. And then it comes out the other side as we get into the 19th and 20th century as being a very scientific discipline, but with the visuals still absolutely essential, quintessential to our understanding of our bodies. So how much of a debt do you think art owes to anatomy? I'm not an art historian, so I would be talking beyond my remit to, to make broad sweeping statements about art in general. But I don't think it's unreasonable to say that it's, it's huge. It's, it's absolutely huge. I mean, if you take, for example, Rembrandt's The Anatomy Lesson of Dr. Tulp, and Rembrandt's correctly regarded as one of, if not the greatest, of, of the Dutch masters. This was his first group portrait, um, 1632, and it features Dr. Tulp, who is the prelector of Amsterdam at the time, so he's, he's the sort of chief medical officer, and he's teaching a bunch of surgeons anatomy with a dissected corpse in front of him on the table. Now, you know, we're talking about Rembrandt here as a young man. The painting was commissioned by Tulp as a, as a, as a statement of his seniority and, and his, his ego. And this is Rembrandt's first group portrait. He then goes on to do many other group portraits. But it is, it's an anatomy lesson. Right? It, is, it is the study of a hanged criminal. And Tulp is there showing the dissected forearm to onlookers, surgeons, who were at, at the time, there was a somewhat a separation between surgery and medicine, which was a more academic and intellectual pursuit rather than the, the cut and shunts of, of the surgeons. So, you know, that's, that's one example of, of how significant anatomical art has been in, in the history of art. There's an interesting twist on that as well, which is that um, Leonardo da Vinci, also quite rightly, one of the greatest masters of art and, and Renaissance science of all time, he did over 200 drawings of anatomized bodies, and his influence was effectively zero because he never published any of them. They remained on his, in his notebooks, in a casket, in his, in his rooms. And although they are unequivocally some of the greatest works of art of all time. I don't think many people would disagree with, with that. Their influence on contemporary art, their influence on contemporary anatomy was effectively zero. And do you think that the anatomist enabled artists to draw people more realistically, to draw their bodies and their movements more accurately? Certainly, and I think that um, some, some people think that that was Leonardo's interest, or that, that was one of Leonardo's interests in, in the anatomized body. We don't actually see a change in the way he paints figures as his anatomical skills develop. But certainly, you know, looking towards how the body is structured gives you an understanding of how the body moves and how the body can be positioned. So Vesalius in the, in the 15th century produced this magnificent book called The Fabrica, and it is the first anatomical textbook. And many of the images in it are so iconic now. He features a set of, they, they're called the Muscle Men series, but men, muscular men, who are progressively on, on every other page stripped of their flesh and their muscles, which hang down so you can expose the muscles underneath, until eventually it's a, it's a skeleton. And, and that's a famous image, a skeleton leaning on his own spade as if he's dug his own grave and, and his head slightly cocked back in a sort of ghoulish grin. Now... The poses that all of these Muscle Men series are in are incredibly classical. You know, they, they, they could be set on plinths in the Parthenon if they weren't set in, in the hills above Padua, which is where he drew them. 
So that sense, you know, trying to understand how the musculature, how the, how the skeletal form shapes how bodies are, is incredibly important. It, it also, late, later on in this story, in the 18th century, has a very much more specific influence, which is that William Hunter, who was one of the Hunter brothers, who were these Scottish um, anatomists and surgeons, he became the first professor of anatomy at the foundation of the Royal Academy. So in that, he was there teaching uh, artists about anatomy in order that they could paint bodies more accurately and position them according to anatomical truth. Gray's Anatomy is obviously one of the great works of anatomy. How did that book come about and why would you say it was so important? Yes, Gray's is really the iconic anatomy textbook in the, in the 19th and 20th century. It is, it is the one book that all medical students are either given or have access to and it is a great tome. And, of course, it's also been made more famous by the fact that there's a popular American TV medical drama with the same name. But back in, in the 19th century, Gray was an ambitious young doctor who, from a well-to-do family who came up to London to study. He was handsome and ambitious and had come from this well-to-do family, and he joined up with a friend, another doctor called Henry Carter, who was a very good draftsman and also at St. George's Hospital, and they set off on this incredibly ambitious task of producing an affordable, convenient tome. Now, it, it, it isn't that affordable and it isn't that convenient nowadays, but it was aimed at medical students in a way that it wasn't meant to be a coffee table book or it wasn't meant to be a fashion accessory as some of the previous anatomy, famous anatomy books had, had been in the previous centuries, notably William Hunter's The Anatomy of the Gravid Uterus, which was a huge sort of four feet wide colossal tome. One of our, the academics in the film described it as a, an act of willy waving. Now, Gray with Carter wanted to do something which was accessible and useful. Now, it, it had... At its first inception, which was in 1860, it had something like 900 illustrations, and they were, they are incredibly beautiful, incredibly intricate. And Carter did something clever, which was he integrated the annotations into the pictures, so that meant more space for text um, for Gray. And it, it, it is kind of un, unwieldy, but it's iconic. It is the one anatomy book that everyone knows of. And there, it's continued, it's been in continuous publication since the 1860s and still exists now. And in, in, in the film, in the series, which is in part five of the series, we look at how Gray's anatomy and, and anatomy in general has entered the modern era where they come with apps and, um, and computer-aided design and have, have really changed. But fundamentally, this key idea, which is to draw what you see, so Gray's Anatomy is very stylized. Now, that, that, what that means is that they are perfect versions of bodies. And one thing that surgeons all say, and anatomists all say, is that when you open up a body, they're never the same as each other. People are very different on the inside um, from each other as we are on the outside. But what these textbooks are show an idealized version. So you know exactly which muscle is going to hook up with which tendon, which is going to be rooted in, in which bone. And, and that's what Gray's is. That is, it is the benchmark. It isn't the most accessed medical anatomy textbook anymore, partly because it became sort of unwieldy in it. And um, I, I think people talk about it losing its, its visual coherence that it had in the 19th and early 20th century. But we interviewed a new editor, and she is putting that back in and trying to style it back up as a you know a singular almost monolithic but definitive anatomy textbook for for the 21st century do we know how some of these anatomical artists would have gone about drawing the, these figures would they literally have stood there next to a body part and and painted it or would it have been more from earlier sketches and memory some of them so the hunters were very keen on on doing that so they introduced this 
William Hunter had this, this concept that he referred to as the mark of truth and the details that are in his pictures, which, which were drawn in initially in chalk by a chap called Van Rinsdick, um, they have details which are totally superfluous to the anatomy, but are, are his stamp of, of, of saying that this is, this is what it was like in the anatomy room. So the one famous example is that there is a reflection of a window, probably the ceiling light in the anatomy room, and it's, it's on the cranium of the baby that is being dissected. Now, it uh, is of no anat anatomical relevance at all, but it was, he puts it in there in order to say, I was there, I am doing this, and, and you can see that because this is exactly what I'm looking at. You're looking at what I'm looking at. Previously, those, those things were not commonplace, and so, you know, we were talking about Tulp, the, the Rembrandt and Asmi lesson of, of Dr. Tulp. It, in a sense, that is a fiction. It is not a, an accurate representation of what would have happened. So, I mean, not least because it would have taken Rembrandt you know, many weeks and months to, to complete the painting. But also we just know that because the way that the corpse, this criminal called Aris Kint, is being dissected is not how they would have done it. So at that time, before refrigeration and before preservation techniques, the dissection would have taken place, A, in winter, which it did in the Tulp Anatomy lesson in January, and it would have taken place over three days, and they would have had a very systematic order in which they did the anatomy, um, the first stage of which would be to remove the viscera, to remove the guts, because these are the things that would rot the quickest and would smell terrible. So day one, open up the chest and abdomen cavity and take out all of the guts. Now, Aris Kint, the hanged criminal in, in the anatomy lesson of Dr. Tulp, is not. He hasn't had his, his guts removed. They are dissecting his left forearm and that couldn't have been what happened so in a sense Rembrandt and Tulp have created this fiction an idealized version in order to create great art there's also a sense that the fact that he's doing the, the forearm may be a referencing of previous anatomists like Vesalius and like Galen and in fact there is a if you look carefully at that painting in the bottom right-hand corner, there is a book that some of the surgeons are sort of craning over the body to look at. And we think, some people think, that that might be Vesalius's great book, The Fabrica. So there's a lot of clues in the painting to give historical reference points. But certainly that is not how the dissection would have taken place. In the series, you've looked at the work of several different artists. Do you now have a favourite anatomical artist from doing the series? I do, and I did before, and it was Rembrandt, and it is Rembrandt, and that, that painting, which is in the Moritz House in Amsterdam, is, for me, I, I know it's an odd thing to, to have a, a favourite painting, or a favourite book, or a favourite record, but I think if forced to choose, then The Anatomy Lesson of Dr. Tulp would absolutely be it. It is, it is a stunning, incredibly beautiful, and, and slightly weird painting in that um, I talk about it on the on the film but because I'd never seen it I've, I've loved this painting since I was a teenager and I'd never seen it until we we were filming and I had a slightly emotional reaction to it but it is you see so much more in standing in front of the painting and and one thing that was very striking is that all of these guys on the left hand side all of these surgeons their eye lines are all weird and the, you know you really don't know what the center of the painting is what are you meant to be looking at because as a tribute to Tulp, the, uh, the prelector of Amsterdam, he's the main guy. He's a guy who has a hat on. None of the others have a hat on, although there's an interesting story you can see on one guy at the back, one of the surgeons. Rembrandt painted a hat in for him for the composition of the painting, but then it was subsequently removed. Uh, he painted over it at the behest of, of Tulp because only the most senior figure in the painting would have a hat on. Only the prelector would be wearing a hat. But anyway, you know, they've got these odd eye lines. There are definitely people who are looking straight down the barrel, straight down the lens at, at you. And this is, it's a weird composition. And the real star of the show is not Tulp. It's, it's the body. It's the hanged man, this, this, this iterant criminal who is painted in, in much lighter than everyone else who is wearing dark clothes and it's a dark background and he is naked and he glows, he bounces off the canvas with this sort of phosphorescence. And I'm sure that was not intended at the time. He's, you know, his, 
his redemption in being an anatomized body for being an iterant criminal that that's that's why he's there but uh if you ask me the first thing you see when you when you see the anatomy lesson of dr tulp it's an almost christ-like supine hanged criminal and that's uh, both weird and brilliant that was adam rutherford the beauty of anatomy is currently showing on wednesdays at 8 30 p.m on bbc4 and you can catch up on previous episodes on the BBC iPlayer. Okay, so that's almost all for this week. Please do join us next time when we'll be talking about Thomas Cromwell and Henry VIII. Thanks for listening to this History Extra podcast, which was produced by Jack Fletcher. Do let us know what you think about this episode by emailing podcast at historyextra.com and we might read out your messages in future episodes. Alternatively, why not keep in touch via Twitter or Facebook, where you'll find us at History Extra. For more great history content, don't forget to visit our website, historyextra.com, where you will find history quizzes, galleries, articles, and more. Plus, it's where you can download every single previous episode of this podcast. 